our social justice committee. We have an excellent program tonight, a very important program, and we have two outstanding presenters. Before we start, I just since we have a number of guests here, which is really wonderful, we're happy that everybody's here. How many people have never been in a synagogue before? Just, just raise your hand. Never been. Everybody can pass the test, okay? And I was going to give a verbal tour, but uh, so if you know, that's great. Um, so uh, we're going to start tonight. I want to first introduce our guests, do a little introduction. That they're each going to do a part of their program, and then we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, our first guest is filmmaker, journalist, radio host James Farr. James is a resident of Pasadena. He's a husband, a father, a social activist, a social entrepreneur, and he has made an outstanding film about a very troubling incident that you may know about involving a young Pasadena resident and the Pasadena police that took place almost one year ago, where there was uh, a use of force in the opinion of a lot of folks, an excessive use of force. So James. Welcome, and we're looking forward to this video that you've made. Uh, our second guest is a friend and a colleague, Skip Hickenbottom. Uh, many of you know the Hickenbottom family. They have been leading activists in the Pasadena and the African American community for several generations. Uh, Skip's father, L.B. Hickenbottom Sr., retired from the U.S. military after 27 years as a major, and then he served 16 years on the Pasadena Unified School District Board. He was president of that board. And uh, Skip's mother, Dolores, who's an old friend of mine, uh, is a community activist and was an aide to Jack Scott when he was an assembly member for this district and then state senator. Skip is an attorney, graduated from UCLA Law School, and for 30 years he's been in practice with his partner, Dale Gronemeyer. Their office is here in the area. They are civil rights attorneys, but they also specialize in employment law, but they've done a, a, a large number of litigations having to do with uh, voting rights, citizens' rights, um, housing issues, uh, access to public records, and so forth. Uh, Skip is the executive, uh, I'd rather the uh, vice president of the Pasadena NAACP. He's co-chair of an organization here in Pasadena called Pasadena's Organizing for Progress that we call POP, that Peter Dreyer and I are both involved with Skip in. And uh, he's also a member of CCOP, the Citizens uh, for Increased Civilian Oversight of Pasadena Police. I'd also like to uh, welcome, now where is she? Chris Okershauser is the founder of CCOP. She's here, she's right back there. She can answer your questions and has the information table. Not me. Uh, I have to <laughs> you forgot about his sister. <laughs> she brought her sister? No, no, no. Skip's sister worked for Chris Holdridge. You forgot about her. I, I, she's an attorney. She also worked for, uh, let's see, Century Housing some years ago. Had to do with getting housing built underneath the Century Freeway. And I guess now she works for Skip Old, so no wonder he's doing so well. It's great. Okay. James and Skip, we're very happy to be here in our synagogue. Um, tonight, our, obviously, as you know, our topic is uh, police accountability in Pasadena, what needs to be done. And the goal, I just want to state at the outset, is not in any way to vilify the Pasadena police. That's not what we're here to do or engage in. As a matter of fact, I was on the board of the Pasadena Police Foundation for 14 years. And I have to say that during that time, I gained tremendous respect uh, for the intelligence, dedication, and integrity of the officers that I met, as well as the leadership. Uh, and they were, in many ways, a very impressive group of people. Uh, so we're here to look at one particular case, maybe that has gone wrong, where someone's rights were violated and he was harmed. And we're trying to explore that and understand what can be done to prevent such things in the future. I'm going to give you, there are a few professors and teachers here tonight. I'm going to give you a little quiz. I'm going to read a list of names. And I want you to think and tell me what they all have in common. Keith Scott, 
Terence Crutcher, Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Christian Taylor, Samuel DeBose, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Juan McDonald, Michael Brown, and Eric Gardner. Arm. They've all been killed by cops. They've all, they're all unarmed black males, different ages. Tamir Rice was 12 years old, who were unarmed and were killed by police officers from 2014 to 2016. Uh, and you know, that's the list that we have, who knows, but there may not be others uh, who are not on that list. Uh, so what's the overall context of, I would say, police killings um, in the United States? According to the Washington Post, just under 1,000 Americans or people in the United States are shot and killed by police every year. And that's from 2015 through 2017. And now in 2018, we're on track. There are approximately 180, uh, sorry, 842 people that have been killed this year by police. And that's people of all backgrounds, all races, all ages, etc. What's interesting is that of the people who have been killed over this period in uh, 2018, 22% are blacks, but the black population in the U.S. is 13%. So what does that tell us? And in this year alone, 13 unarmed black males have been killed. And you may have also read or heard about what happened in Chicago this past weekend when the security guard outside of a bar in a suburb confronted a gunman who came into the bar was shooting a security guard and after him into the parking lot he subdued subdued him the 26 year old security guard pulled his own gun and held it on the guy's head until the police came and then the police came and shot and killed the security guard and the question is would they have shot and killed him if he were white or was did he pay a higher price because he was black and he was doing his job and was doing it now, so the question might be, when we look at these statistics, is there an epidemic going on of racial profiling, of beatings, of violence, and killings against black people? Is it an epidemic? And are we in the midst of an epidemic and an upsurge today? It's interesting that in 2008, 10 years ago, the uh, ACLU of Southern California did a study. And what they concluded was the following. Blacks and Hispanics are, quote, overstocked, overfrisked, oversearched, overarrested. Black pedestrians and drivers have a 3,400 times greater chance to be stopped by LAPD 10 years ago than whites. 3,400 times. And Latinos have a 360 time greater chance of being stopped. So the question is, what's going on? Is it an epidemic? Now, Peter Dreyer, who's written about this quite a bit, said in an article that appeared in the American Prospect magazine in July of 2016, uh, the following, he made the following conclusion. Because more incidents of police abuse now being captured are now being captured on camera, white Americans are waking up to how different black lives are. I think Peter said it well. So that's exactly what we we're dealing with tonight. Only what we were dealing with tonight is not a situation from Ferguson, Missouri, or Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or St. Paul, Minnesota, but right here in Pasadena. And as I mentioned, on November 9th, 2017, a bystander video captured Pasadena Police Department, two officers using force against a 21-year-old African-American man, by the, a young man by the name of Chris Ballou. That video was posted on YouTube. It went viral in the United States and around the world, and more than a million people saw what happened. And that's part of the to the city of Pasadena. So first, we're going to listen to a presentation and watch the film that James has made about this incident using bystander and dash cam video. Then Skip is going to tell us about the policies that need to be changed to prevent something like this 
from ever happening, assuming that we believe it's unjustified, and how we in this congregation and this community can help. Finally, we'll have questions and answers. We'll hope to answer everything that you uh, have to ask, and then we'll adjourn to our social hall, and you can then talk with Chris Obersalager about getting involved in the uh, Citizens for Increased Civilian Oversight of the Pasadena. Now it's my honor to introduce James Farr. And uh, James, I'd like you to kind of come up and start the video. I'd also say, James, we're especially grateful to you for coming tonight and taking the time to be with us. James lost his father just under a week ago, so he's in mourning, but he said, in order to be here, he would honor his father because his father would have had the same message. And you can see James and his father look alike. And there's a picture of James' father here. Really handsome guy. So, James, come on up. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Can you guys all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like for us to just pause for just a second, and I'd like to honor the memory of my father. I'd like to with the honorable Reverend Dr. Lloyd Farr. Um, I'd like to for us all to remember those who lost their lives in Pittsburgh just a few weeks ago while in the house of worship. But I'd also like you guys to remember those victims in South Carolina who also were in church worshiping and their lives were snuffed out because of AIDS. So if we can just pause for just a second. So what we're going to do this evening, and, and I won't do a whole lot of talking, uh, Rabbi pretty much framed up everything for us this evening, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the process of making this film and some personal experiences, but to put it in context, uh, Jay, they can't hear you back here. They can't hear me back here. Can you hear me better now? Is the mic on? There you go. Okay, here we go. All right, so uh, to put this in the context, um, when I was commissioned to do this project, I, I did it through the lens of uh, the 18-year-old James who was assaulted by police officers. Yeah. So this process was very personal to me. Uh, it was very traumatizing to me, uh, and it also was very triggering to me. Um, but first what we'll do is I'm going to show these two pieces. This first one is about nine minutes long. Uh, we're looking at it in a reverse order. This piece I call false and deceptive statements. We know what the officer's statements are. Now we match the video up to see exactly how it plays out. So after that plays, I'll come back and talk to you just a few more minutes more, and then we'll jump into an interview that I did with uh, John Burton, the attorney who's representing uh, Christopher. Who is commissioned? This film is commissioned by POP, Policy Best Practices. But again, I challenge you and I invite you to ask yourself, what did Christopher do wrong? You guys have an answer to that question yet? What did Christopher Ballou do wrong? He was a young black man. That's what he did wrong. I don't see that as wrong, but no, that's the same. <laughs>
of two minutes and 26 seconds that I had to expand out into a 30 minute uh, presentation and then later into some other. Uh, so when my editor and I first sat down to, to work on this project, we, first day, we had to take a break. Because as you're watching this assault, or an attempted murder, as I have called this, this piece, it got to a point to where I know the cadence of how bad they whipped Chris's ass. So I had to replay that over and over and over and over for about 35 to almost 40 hours. That became seared in my memory. That was traumatizing. That was triggering. That was very difficult to watch. And now that we could produce this piece, we've had a chance to show it a few times here in town, and people have you know, been in that rage phase. But they haven't done anything. None of you have done anything. So I'm going to invite you to do something. When we get into our discussion, I'm going to update you on some things that are happening with his case that have not been made public yet. What I will tell you, it is business as usual down on Garfield. Mm -hmm. And the value of a life of an African-American young man seems to have little value. Rabbi read off a list of names. And they all share one thing in common, which you guys knew. They're dead. They're no longer with us. Chris has the unfortunate pleasure, if you will, of living with the trauma that the same two officers who nearly took his life almost saved his, also saved his life. <laughs> Sit with that for a minute. <laughs> Chris would have been dead had Officer Luhan not got in the way. That's the reality of, of, of that um, situation. Um, I, I promise that I wouldn't talk too long, um, because we're definitely going to leave plenty of time for us to uh, have some questions and, and answers. Um, this journey started for me uh, two years ago around the Philando Castile, Austin Sterling deaths. While vacationing in Denver with my wife, um, I found myself glued to CNN, weeping. And a, just sometimes deep bellowing type of cry because I'm, I'm watching people that look like me. I'm watching my experience again play out on national TV, on CNN. I'm supposed to be having fun with my wife. So I decided I wanted to do something. And in doing something that meant organizing. And in organizing that meant making mistakes. And in making mistakes, I learned how to do things a little bit differently. And then in doing these things differently, we started coming together as a community to heal, to strategize, and now to come into your community and into your congregation and talk to you about how you, you've all heard the term allies, right? I need co-conspirators. <laughs> I need y'all to have some skin in the game. Have something to lose. You can't lead and tell us how to feel, but you can certainly empathize with what we're experiencing. This process of what I do as a journalist, as, as a filmmaker, as a content creator, it is free press, but press is not free. You know, I do this with the support of organizations, with the support of individuals through through in kind, they support in many other ways, and, and and I invite you guys to find an organization that you can support. If it's Pop, if it's CPOP, if it's NAACP, if it's the Conversation Live, we welcome it because independent journalism is dying. We live in a world of fake news, as you all know, so it's important that we tell the narratives from our lens and with our voice. I'll, I'll 
conclude with this and then we'll talk with uh, Skip and the rabbi. Tupac Shakur once said, he may not be the brain that changes the world, but he may inspire the brain that does. And that's really what we're trying to do here in, in, in this work. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I hope the next time we're here, we're talking about something a little bit more joyous and celebratory. Um, this is not my favorite thing to do, but it is very cathartic. Um, it, it allows me to heal. And um, so we'll turn, I'll turn it over to the rabbi. And, and Keep them on patrol. 
Then come February, we have the Black History Festival up at Jackie Robinson Park. And I went to the Jack, Jack, Jack the Festival. I had a good time, and we all had a good time. It's a great, it's a great parade. She comes to it sometimes. It's a great parade. But then somebody told me afterward, do you know that Lujan and Esparza were assigned to the Jackie Robinson Festival? They assigned these two officers to the parade to the festival to, to be patrol. Now, if you don't understand the insensitivity of that to our community, then you really don't understand what happened that night and what happened afterwards. So we were outraged by what happened, and we were very upset by what happened. And frankly, shortly after that, Chief Sanchez, who was a good chief and ran a good department, he uh, resigned. And we have a new chief, and he's working with us much more carefully to kind of get things reformed. So I want to give you kind of some background. I kind of want to get that off my chest about how the Pasadena Police Department, I think, behaved very badly after this incident, even after what happened that night. But let's talk about what we could do to make the Pasadena Police Department better, because it is a good police department. I want you all to know that. There are some really good officers in this police department. I don't need to go through names, but believe me, this is, a office, this is a police department that is trying to do better, and it's a good police department. But we think it could be a better police department. And we can, it could be better if it changes its use of force policy. So one of the things that we do is we work with groups like the ACLU to find out what the best practices are in other cities for use of force policies. Chris Ockerhouse and some of the other people in Seacock have come up along with the ACLU with a list of things that the Pasadena Police Department could do to change its policy of use of force to make it a better policy. So let me kind of highlight some things for you that we think would make it a better use of force policy. The policy right now does not mandate the officers de-escalate interactions with the public that may be to violence. So they weren't required to de-escalate that situation with Chris Ballou. They, he could have maintained distance between them and given verbal commands and allowed them to respond to the commands. But all too often, officers put their hands on black men and they deal with them. And that's always the beginning of trouble. It's a testosterone thing. So who's going to be in charge? And so why do you put his hands on Chris for a traffic stop? How many of you get traffic stop and get grabbed by the officer? So to me, quickly, he starts to escalate the policy. The policy does not require officers to exhaust alternatives to using force against an individual. There are alternatives to him putting his hands on Chris, him beating with the baton, and him pulling his gun that he didn't consider that night. The, the policy does not require an officer to use only the level of force that is proportional to the threat of harm they face. Again, these could be reforms to the passing in a police officer's policy of use of force that would make it a valid policy. In other cities, they have these types of uh, policies, and then they find that it does decrease the use of force. The policy does not provide clear guidance to officers about when they may use force. <coughs> if they can use force if they are reasonably in fear of their life, but it doesn't give them specific guidelines about when they're supposed to use force and what kind of force to use. And the policy does not prevent certain use of force is widely established to be dangerous unsafe, like chokeholds and shooting for movie vehicles. I don't know if any of you remember the Kitchens McDade shooting. One of the issues in that shooting a few years ago, but the officers were shooting at this young man, who again was an unarmed African American they ended up killing. They were shooting at him from the vehicle that was moving. That's a dangerous policy, not knowing the background that you're shooting at shooting. So there are some things that we think could be used to change the use of force policy. We've offered this to the Pasadena Police Department. They are, to their credit, doing a review of the use of force policy. They are, to their credit, have hired an outside civilian uh, person, uh, Robert Brazil, from the Police Foundation to do the review. They are, to their credit, having the Baloo incident reviewed by, office, by uh, former Chief, office, Chief Police Brazil, and also the incident revolving Reginald Thomas, and another unfortunate incident where an African American man was killed by the Pasadena Police Department. So are, there are steps that are being taken to try to deal with this use of force policy, and we're asking you to stay vigilant and stay mindful of the situation, and we're hoping that maybe some of you would consider joining a group like CECOP or POP and work on some of these issues with us. So we are making progress in that direction. The other thing that I think is evident by what happened that night is probably a more subtle but more kind of a pervasive issue, and that's the issue of who gets pulled over in the first place. Why are the passing of these 
pulling off of people at the corner of Woodbury Church as they went up, 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 the, up the street. One of the things that you don't know is John, Mercer, John Burton happened to have an African-American daughter. And she got pulled over about a week later. And she got profiled. And she got asked about her gang affiliation. And she got asked to get out the car and go through the whole thing, too. And she has got a gang person in criminal record. So the fact of the matter is that a lot of people in the Northwest community believe that the African Americans and Latino youth are being targeted for stops, stop and frisk, so that we're much more likely to be in this situation because we're being treated unfairly who we're who they're pulling over. There is a new law in the state of California called the Racial Identify Identity and Profile Act. It's called RIPPLE. And that's going to require all Departments by I think the year, what's the year, Chris? Do you know? Next, next July. To keep information, demographic information, on the, on the people that they're pulling over. So eventually, we'll start to collect data statewide from police departments about whether or not racial profiling is a perception problem, as uh, the city manager would tell us, or it's a reality problem as we move. Pasadena, to its credit, has agreed to do an early implementation of RIPPLE. So, because we're a small department, we don't have to do it for a few years now. But we've agreed to start doing that next year. So sometime next year, we'll get a pilot program in Pasadena, and we'll start collecting data and information about who's getting pulled over and why. I've heard a lot of troubling information. I've heard 90% of the people get arrested in Pasadena for marijuana are, are Latinos and African American. So to me, there's some issues about who's getting pulled over and why. And I think, you know, we can talk more about the social economic situations that drive that. But I think one thing is kind of obvious is that when you are a prosecutor or you're a police officer, your job is to arrest people and to prosecute people. And a lot of what happens in terms of police activity is complaint driven. And the reality is that the police department of Pasadena get most of their calls for help from Northwest Pasadena. So most of the concentration of suppression of gang activity occurs in Northwest Pasadena. So I think that to simply say that the police officers are to blame for all this kind of misses the point, okay? Everybody has a shooter bias. Everybody has some fear of young African-American Latino men. And when they do scientific studies of this, they show this, African-Americans too. So I think as a community, we have to see what do we want the police to do? Because what they're doing right now is they're instilling fear in the Northwest Pasadena as a way to deal with the gang activity. We do have gang activity. We had problems earlier this year with the gang war between Duarte gang members and Pasadena gang members, and people got shot so in the same street where this happened nearby. African American young men and women got shot by, by gang members in Duarte, and we shot someone there. And this gang suppression unit did a great job of fighting those people and bring them to justice, and it took a lot of guns off the street. So, pre-tap stops, which are stops by police departments for traffic violations, and they're not really worried about the traffic violation, which is what happened that night, is a part of the gang and a part of the police. And we have a police officers here tonight who tell you that's probably an effective part of police. So one of the things we also are trying to do, and this is, I think, the most important thing we're trying to do, is begin a dialogue between the community and the police department about how we can work more together to solve crime in Pasadena, Northwest Pasadena, and not spend all our time pointing figures and accusing each other. I just saw a very good documentary that Jen brought to us at the last event we had at Kevin, which is the community center right next to La Pitta Russell Park in Pasadena. It's called The Walking Mall Black. And one of the things of that film, and it's got a lot of themes, is the notion of forgiveness. The notion that Police, and mostly we're talking about white police, need to accept the fact that historically they have been the face of oppression in our community. They've enforced a lot of bad laws against African Americans historically, and they've done a lot of bad things. And so they need to understand that they need to ask for forgiveness for some of their bad acts. But also, this film talked about the need for African Americans to understand that they need to also consider giving forgiveness so that we can move on with a more productive dialogue. We need the police in Northwest Pasadena. They keep us safe. I'm a part of the uh, police's uh, advisory council. So are three other members from our group in CECOM. 
Juliana Serrano from All Saints, Sherry Shockey, a defense attorney, and Pablo Alvarado, who runs the job center in Lake. This police chief has brought in a council with a majority of people who've been critics of this department the last four or five years. We've had now two or three events where we've had police union and officer, line officers, not the brass, but line officers come and tell us the challenge that they have in passing in policing. So I'm going to invite you to invite the police here to hear their side of it too. You know, we're reformers, we're activists, we're people who believe the police department could be better and needs to change and needs to change now. But people like Robert Grant, who I keep pointing them out, but Robert came to us at our first meeting and said, listen, the problem with what you guys are doing is you're not hearing from the other side. And we said he was right. We've had now three events since that where we've had the police officers and they've gone very well. So again, I would hope that you would understand this is a real problem in our community. I hope you want to get involved in it. But I hope you want to know that it's not going to be a problem that's going to be solved easily. This is a problem that's part of our community. We've had too many shootings, we've had too many killings, and we need to do that. So I thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you, Skip. Uh, if I could give a plug for POP, the organization that Skip and I are part of, as well as Peter, those conversations with uh, the police and uh, some of the young black leaders in the community have been sponsored and uh, I helped along by Pop. Um, this is a good time for questions. So does anyone have a question or a comment or something you'd like to hear from? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Max asked this for the PCC area. Uh, I think we had a misunderstanding over there that uh, we were told that there were some sort of spokespeople. <laughs> yeah, we, we were told that there were there would be some sort of police spokespeople to to have the their uh, yeah. point of view on this. Yeah, I'm not sure who told you that, but yeah. that's not something that we're I'm not in, in coming in this. Robert's mind, you can ask him. Yeah. Uh, no would, would you be going up there? Excuse me, Robert. It's up to you guys. <laughs> I'm you will nail anybody you want. Hey, Robert, so. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Chase, don't, don't give me the mic because I'm going to speak. Look, I'll answer any question you want. Right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, other questions, comments? Yeah, Howard? Um, I'll just speak loudly. I think you'll be able to hear me. Okay, okay. okay I'll wait. <laughs> Thanks. So, listening to Mr. Burton, it sounds like there were a lot of policies already in place. They were just ignored uh, over and over again during that whole incident. And, and it seems like, and by the way, I agree, there are additional policies that we should put in place, and I'm in favor of that. But that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was that we had cops who were looking for a fight who may or may not have been racist, but certainly were on guard. And, and you can put more policies in place, but until you start dealing with the issue of enforcing those policies, instead of defending folks when they, they violate them so obviously, um, we're going to have the same problem. Um, what, I, what I will say to that, I mean, the, the obvious is that they were out of, uh, and it's not jurisdiction because officers can affect arrests anywhere in the state of California. Um, but Essentially, what they were doing was fishing. They were hunting. They were looking um, for something um, or someone. Um, it's not a policy issue. It's a constitutional issue. There's too much latitude that officers have in terms of how they're able to use force. And so you may not know that Pasadena Police Department, like many departments, they don't even write their own policies. There's a company that literally like a drop down menu and you want this and you want that and you want that and they spit out a report to you and that's how the policies are written. Um, what needs to happen has to happen in Sacramento. That is where uh, the biggest impact, we have to affect the legislation. What each and every one of you in here can do tomorrow, tonight, is email the city manager is email the mayor and ask them why hasn't this investigation been concluded? 
Former Chief Sanchez promised five to seven months. Interim Chief Perez says he'd like to see it done sooner. It's been a year. That, that was my point, by the way. You know, you gotta, you, you, you gotta should, enforce the stuff that's out you, there. You should also know of the conflict of interest between the city attorney, who is representing both the officers and investigating the officers. How is that okay? Let me just add, add, add this slide to that. I've worked with John before, and of course I come from you know, that side of the table, so to speak. But John often points out to me that it's not really a training problem, usually that he runs into with, with bad officers. It's they just don't follow their training. So they were told, this is things that they're told not to do, but they do it anyway. One of the other things that troubled me is Officer Esparza, the officer with the baton, was on probation from Bakersfield. Yeah. He was not in the once you're, I think when you're, you, you get your, you are off probation, and it's a police officer's bill of rights, so there's a pretty good bill of rights for police officers. It requires them to be judged by other police officers or process, which is frankly not open to the public for them to be disciplined. So if there is discipline, frankly, you're not going to know about it unless, of course, he's not working there in the press finds out and let you know. But Officer Sparser wasn't under that yet because he was, a, he was on probation. So he could have been terminated when they saw that tape, which they probably saw in, in, in the middle of November. They chose not to do it. So I think one of the things that you have to ask them, have they already decided that this was in policy? Have they already made a decision before they did this investigation that they're going to find a way to make this a within policy situation and limit their, their risk of, of liability? John Burton is a lawyer. He sues for money. He gets multi-million dollar uh, uh, decisions and, uh, and judgments. And you know, risk management is a part of what the city does. And so what our belief is, the reason they didn't run out the clock on these investigations is they wait until they settle the lawsuit before they admit that the officers did wrong. Mm -hmm. And I can understand there's always a tension between getting you know, the city to, to limit its liability and getting to the truth. But that's where I think the conflict for the city's attorney's office comes in. Because if they're, if they're sitting in the administrative hearing, and supposed to be giving the officers discipline part of that process, why are they saying you put to pay the same officers? It just doesn't make any sense to us. So those are things that we're concerned about, which we think that we need to start looking at. And you know, at the, at the heart of this, for CCOP, it's about the civilian, increased civilian oversight of the Pasadena Police Department. Other police departments operate with independent civilian oversight, independent police officers. People who are trained professional, oftentimes retired officers, but it will take a second look. In the Kendrick McDade shooting, there is a report by the OIR, the mm -hmm. Office of Independent Review. I go online and look at it. It's a much different conclusion about what happened that night with the Pasadena Police Department said. Uh, Reginald Thomas was a young man who was as an incident with the Pasadena Police and he ended up dead. There, eventually, we will find out what happened to those officers. But there's an independent report on that that we were promised that we're waiting on. They settled that case months ago. So bottling these reports up and waiting until the, the public dies down a year or a year and a half later, or two years later, the McDade case. We had to sue to get the report in the McDade case. It's part of the problem. If you're open and transparent, you should release body camera videos of critical incidents right away. We're moving towards that. But you shouldn't wait two years for us to hear that maybe this was not in policy. So we think that some of these reforms that we've been pushing for would help us get to the point we need to get to. Yes, uh, Chris, do you, uh, okay, go ahead, and then behind you, we have uh, Chris is gonna also, no? You're just raising your hand. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, um, uh, a few months ago, I had a discussion with the Pasadena cop about this, this video and uh, um, I saw, and so the first thing I, I told them was that they were out of policy driving into Altadena. And immediately he said, well, it's out of policy, but it's not illegal. So, and at that point, the whole, the whole conversation kind of broke down and he just wanted to tell me about this